listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As many of you people have been listening to our program over the last dozen years or so, you know that from time to time we like to give you some really wonderful tips on how you can enjoy a luxurious lifestyle by expanding your mind and certainly enjoying and understanding the rules. On our program today, we thought we would give you a more condensed version by a wonderful book that has been produced known as How to Live Like a Millionaire When You're a Million Short. Our guest joining us in the Beyond 50 radio program today is an author, travel and entertainment reporter, as well as an award-winning film and television writer, writing for such shows as Murphy Brown, Fame, and Friday the 13th, the series. She's going to be joining us today, and she's going to be sharing what it has been like to live like a millionaire for more than 20 years and share these ideas with us so we can expand our horizons and understand how we can achieve those goals without having to become a millionaire and certainly, if you're not winning the lottery, well, we can take the very next step. Marilyn Anderson joining us here on the program today. Marilyn, thank you for being here. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Daniel. Now, tell me about this coat that you have here on the cover of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to know about that. Well, it's actually, the... it's a really fun little jacket, and I got it at a, a consignment shop. Mm -hmm. And the dress, which is a Robert Rodriguez, which is a very expensive brand, and the jacket cost less than $100, even though they were probably worth some 500 to to 1000 So that's what I like to do. I love to find things that I love, but not at the regular prices. You know, and I thought that would be a great place to start. Uh, I remember years ago as I first was breaking into radio, there was a journalist out of New York, and I know that you've got a lot of living experience in New York, and we'll dive into some of that in a minute, especially when it comes to theaters, you know, and going to see plays and musicals and the like. But her name was Ann Powers, and, you know, very well-known journalist out of New York, and she was writing about her bohemian lifestyle. And uh, what was funny about what she was talking about is I thought, well, you know, here's somebody who obviously is traveling around promoting a book, so she must be doing pretty well financially. What was interesting is during the course of the interview is that she talked about how she actually shopped for all of her clothes in places like a thrift store, Salvation Army, Goodwill, you name it. But she says the big reason wasn't necessarily to save money, although that's a, a pretty good motivation, but it was also because it was a statement as to going against the idea of, uh, what do you call that, sweat labor, you know, that you don't buy your clothes brand new because that's sort of what you're contributing to. But she says also you just find fantastic deals. And what I like about your book about how to live like a millionaire is we're not talking about cheap. In fact, that seems to be kind of a sin word, as you say in your book, but it's more of finding value and then finding it for the best possible price. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, and also finding things that you love, either things you like to have or places you like to go, things that you enjoy and will bring more fun into your life, but not having to be able to uh, break the bank with them. Absolutely. Now, you actually started off in college, as I understand, uh, studying biology. Was that correct? Oh, yes. <laughs> now yes. You, and then you become a TV writer for Friday the 13th, so I think there's kind of a correlation there. <laughs> no, I always say my, my mother wanted me to meet a doctor. I met lots of them. I just didn't marry any of them. But, but my passion was always uh, in the creative arts. I did acting for a while, and then when I switched to writing, it was great because then I created all the parts, not just one, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so that was really my my love. And uh, luckily, I I was open enough and uh, decided to just go for it. And it's really where I belong. I mean, I I love doing creative things and I love creating stories. And along the way, it's caused me to have this lifestyle, which has also been an exciting journey. Well, there's no doubt about that. You not only share a lot of great stories about your own travels and your experiences, but also those of others. Now, as we were talking about at the beginning of the show with the coat, let's talk about fashion, because certainly a lot of people want to feel, especially when the Oscars are rolling around, boy, I'd sure like to wear that dress, or I'd like to be seen on the red carpet, you know, wearing that Tell us about what you share in your book where people can kind of open up and expand their minds, as you were talking about earlier, when it comes to fashion. Well, what I discovered, and this is really exciting, of course, most people know about consignment shops, and that's 
a great place to find good things. But if you're going to a fancy event, how many times do women go out and they might spend, you know, 500, 1,000 or a lot of money on a dress that they wear to one function and never wear again? Cool. And what I've discovered, there are a number of sites that are just fantastic because you can actually pick out a $2,000 dress and wear it for $50. And no, that doesn't mean buying a dress and then wearing it and returning it. Uh, there's a, a number of sites uh, that rent very high-end dresses. One of them is called rentstherunway.com. And then there's uh, one called latote.com and there's winniebee.com. And it's fabulous because you can go get a fabulous, expensive dress and wear it and then send it back and you don't clean it. They clean it themselves. And for $50, you have looked like a million-dollar gal wearing a dress that is just knocking the socks off everybody. So that's one way to do it. And um, uh, with Rent the Runway, which is really great, you know, if, if your viewers, I know, they, a lot of them don't have jobs, but they might have daughters who, have, who work a regular job and they either like to wear different clothes at the office every day or they like going to parties. Uh, RentTheRunway.com even has, and so does Latote, they have monthly programs where you just pay a given amount every month, like $139 a month, and you can literally get uh, different dresses to wear every single day and then just return them. It's what I call, it's like the Netflix of fashion. Yeah, and you know, and it's neat because I didn't know about this in as much as that I know that when prom came around, you went to a tuxedo shop and you run in a tuxedo. Not too many teenagers can afford their own tuxedo. And But I didn't know about something like this, and I thought, you know, that's astounding that women can actually look this way. But, but as you said, too, uh, that it isn't something that's going to hang in your closet for that next special occasion, you know, that you can actually put it out there where somebody else can use it. And although maybe some listeners would think, well, you know, that pride and ownership sort of a thing. But this is something, you know, as you said, you don't red carpet every day, so why not, you know, look like you're red carpeting when you're going out on the town? So. Speaking of going out of the town, chances are you might want to go out and see a play and you talk about things such as going to see Hamilton, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, I'm a theater lover. I mean, I did theater myself for a long time. I sang and danced and acted, and I played Anita in West Side Story, A Boy Like That Would Be a Brother. <laughs> so I love theater. But theater tickets today, whether you're in New York, which of course costs an astronomical amount, and, and even if it comes to your hometown, some of these big theaters can cost a lot of money. So there are ways now, which I think are tremendous, to go to theater at such discount prices. You mentioned Hamilton. Well, Hamilton on Broadway, uh, the tickets can be 800 to to $1,000 for a ticket. Yeah, but, that was a hot show, too, especially that it won all the awards that it did last year as well. So Yeah, but they actually have lotteries for shows like Hamilton, and Hamilton happens to have one of the lowest prices. They have a digital lottery, and if you win the digital lottery, you get a chance to buy two seats for the first row at $10, and they do this for every single show. And the good news about Hamilton is that when it travels to another town, so when it comes to Portland, for instance, they will probably have the lottery there too. So um, so it's good to know. And other shows like Wicked and The Book of Mormon and Rent and uh, a lot of the shows on Broadway now all have lotteries. And the lotteries, uh, they used to always be in person. So you'd have to go down to the theater two hours before the show, put your name in the hat. You don't have to wait in line. You just have to get there like 10 minutes before they pick the numbers. And you put your name in, in the bowl and then they would call out 20 to 30 uh, numbers, and whosever number was called got to buy two tickets for generally the first row. Uh, some of the shows still do the in-person lotteries, but a, not, a lot of the shows now are doing digital lotteries. So the good news is you don't have to go down there, but the bad news is with the digital lottery, uh, the odds are less because more people do it because they don't have to physically go to the, to the theater until it's time. 
You know, and I was kind of wondering, too, as you were talking about that, especially as I was reading it in your book, is that you hear about these shows, let's just say like Hamilton, you know, sold out for eight straight weeks or ten straight, however long it seems to be sold out. But the truth of the matter is that not every night are there going to be full seats unless you can create a way for that to happen. You know, I mean, eventually it kind of peters out just a little bit where there will be some empty seats, and the theater would rather fill a seat maybe at a more economical price than to have the seat empty at all because, after all, think about the excitement of knowing that you're going to a play that's been sold out for 52 straight weeks. Well, there was a reason we were able to do that. Have you found that to be kind of the case, too, when it comes to theaters? Well, what the theaters do in that case is they have what's known as rush seats, and um, a lot of shows, again, when they travel or sometimes if it's a local theater, rush seats are seats that are not filled, and at the last minute, uh, sometimes it's the morning of the show, oftentimes it's before the show starts, they will uh, offer at a lower price uh, tickets to the show for seats that are left, and that's the rush seat. And uh, then some theaters, some local theaters, also have a pay-what-you-can night. And uh, I think there's theaters in Portland that do this. There's one night of the week that a theater will have a pay-what-you-can because they like to offer arts to everyone, not just people who have big budget. So uh, check your local theater and see uh, if they have a pay what you can night. And you could pay $10 or $5 or even $1 and go in and see a wonderful show that other people might be paying $30, 40 or $50 for. And you might even also get the opportunity at some of these theaters where you get to meet producers or the people that were involved in the writing of the play and, and even actors. And you talked about, you know, that uh, I guess it was meeting Tim Robbins at one point, right? <laughs> right. Well, in, in L.A., there's a theater that's actually owned by Tim, and they have a pay-what-you-can night, and he he's often at the theater. And so I, I met him and talked to him. And uh, another way to do it is uh, – if you love theater and can't afford the prices all the time, uh, sign up to Usher uh, at a nice venue, and you'll get to see the shows that are there. And sometimes if you Usher, uh, you can not only see the shows for which you Usher, but they'll let you come on other nights to see other shows. So that's another way that uh, a lot of friends of mine in different cities, both here in L.A., I have a friend who does it in Texas at a big theater, the Long Center, and he ushers, and that way you do meet a lot of the people who uh, who are part of the theater staff as well. In fact, a lot of uh, college students do this, and sometimes they get paid to do it, uh, but they also get a chance to meet people, and if it's their uh, desire to go into show business, sometimes they can get uh, recommendations from them or referrals, and it's a good way to, to, to get in to know the people there and to possibly uh, learn about the theater from a different side of things. And you know, Marilyn, as you uh, say this now, I wanted to encourage our listeners to listen carefully to your message here because it certainly resonates through the book. Certainly we're first going to want to pick up how to live like a millionaire when you're a million short because you're interested in things that you're passionate about. And we're talking about like dressing, walking the red carpet, and going to see a great play like Hamilton for what seems to be pennies on the dollar, if you will. Um, but the big thing is is that your book also starts talking about how you start co-participating in things, as you were saying, become an usher, maybe even just volunteer as an usher, but that gets you in where you can enjoy these sort of things. But the big thing that I'm, that I'm pointing out is that you're beginning to give your time and your energy uh, in these directions where the rewards are phenomenal. Now, to give you an idea personally, uh, one of the things you were talking about was uh, PBS. Believe it or not, that's how I actually broke my chops into radio nearly 20 years ago. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and it was really, really a great opportunity. I just happened to be, you know, quick story. I was at a uh, a meeting at Town Hall. It was for Toastmasters, and I was breaking into it. And there was a guy that stood up and said, I'd like to be the world's greatest radio interviewer. And at that time, I thought, you know, it's about time that I start pursuing my passion here. You know, I've talked about how I wanted to be in radio and, and whatnot. And so I went up and I, and I talked to him, and I said, so you're talking about being a great radio interview. Do you do radio somewhere? I figured, you know, this door kind of opened right in front of me here. And he says, yeah, this is where I do it. Why don't you go down and talk to this guy and volunteer? 
And I have said on this show over and over and over, there is nothing greater, no rewards greater than volunteering because doors will open in ways you couldn't even imagine. Now, here I am. I'm there, and I'm ready to volunteer. And the guy says, well, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I've always wanted to kind of be a broadcaster. And he says, great. What would you think about interviewing people? Now, I never thought about that before. What I thought about was spinning records like Wolfman Jack and the like as I was growing up. And he says, and I thought, well, that could be kind of cool. So what do I do? Well, we have this show called Profiles. And for 30 minutes or an hour, you decide. And we have people who actually come into the studio. And you can sit and talk to them, whether it's about their book like we're doing right now or, or anybody. And what was neat about PBS, of course, is they get people coming into the studio. And you were talking about how for a place like PBS, you can volunteer on their phone book or phone banks during, uh, you know, uh, pledge drives and things like that, which I've been and, and volunteer as well. And I couldn't believe how my dream was manifesting so quickly. Here I was actually face to face with celebrities, politicians, best selling authors, people even just like yourself, one on one. And and I thought I couldn't believe that it would happen that fast. <laughs> you know, and and here I'm on your, uh, for instance, your uh, Facebook page here, How to Live Like a Millionaire When You're a Million Short. And I'm taking a look to, and thinking about people who want to travel to exotic places. And we have this one, it's called Inhabitat.com, where you say Italy is giving away hundreds of historic castles and villas for free. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, that was a pretty amazing one, yeah, because I guess they were – a town had lost a lot of its uh, residents, and they want to find new residents. And so they decided they would. They had all these fabulous castles and homes, and they said, if people will come and live here, we'll give them the place for free. They just have to come to our town and establish residence. And I, I love your story about what you did, Daniel, because – that's what I found in my life is that being open to the possibilities uh, and and not taking no for an answer when you want to do something and people say you can't, just, you know, knowing some of the things that you might want. I mean, that is actually how I became a travel reporter because I had written my first book, Never Kiss a Frog, A Girl's Guide to Creatures from the Dating Swamp, and I was going across the country doing um, some presentations and some interviews. And I realized if I went on my own nickel, I would probably be staying at Motel 6s or Best Westerns. And so I decided, well, what if I go and am able to stay at five-star or four-star hotels? And so I thought, well, let me try to write about hotels and restaurants. And I talked to some travel reporters, and they all said to me, oh, no one will ever host you at a hotel or give you dinner if you're not writing for the New York Times or for Condé Nast or whatever. But I didn't listen to them, and I sort of started my own uh, travel column. And it turns out now I've been all over the country staying at fabulous places. I stayed at the uh, Monterey Hotel and Spa in their uh, honeymoon suite. I stayed in New Orleans at the... Ernest Hemingway suite, I was on a trip, a five-star trip to Taiwan, and the bottom line is I didn't write for the New York Times, I didn't write for Condé Nast, but I found a way just to start my own little column. And that's what's wonderful about today is you can take your interests and your passions and either start blogging about them or you can go online and start a YouTube channel, and that's how a lot of people actually have become millionaires just by doing something that they're passionate about and talking about it, and suddenly you do something and the world opens up to you in all kinds of ways. So it, it's been, as I said in the beginning, it's been a journey for me, and I just encourage people to go out there and try the things they've always wanted to do because there's a way to do it now that, uh, that can really be exciting for you. I know one of the things we've shared as a segment here on our program has been uh, that we have moved more into a sharing economy. And uh, one of the uh, ways that this is totally true is let's take a look at how Uber, for instance, has changed taxi services. I mean, phenomenally. 
you know. Oh, my gosh, yes. And so take a look at that. Now, just imagine that you're somebody out there that wants to drive a Bentley, but unfortunately you didn't. <laughs> but the fact is, is there are exotic car clubs and things like that out there where people can actually have these experiences. So for our automobile enthusiasts, let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a few different ways to do that. I mean, there there are some specific places, and if you go online and just Google, you know, exotic car sharing places, you'll find there's membership clubs where you can join, and not only do you get to drive a car uh, of your choice for a couple of weeks, but you'll meet other car enthusiasts uh, who are doing the same thing. The other thing, you can just rent a car for uh, for a couple of weeks or for a weekend, you want to go out to a great event and you don't want to go in your, which is a great car, your, uh, your hybrid, your uh, Toyota, but uh, you want to show up in a great car. Well, instead of having to buy it, go rent a car for the weekend and feel elegant and special. And it doesn't cost that much, and yet you're having a great time. Or what I love, I say this would make a great gift for a man, and, of course, Father's Day is coming up. In Arizona, there's a place called the Bob Bondurant School of High Performance Driving, and you can just go there or get a gift for your guy so he can go there for uh, a weekend or a few days and do hot laps, and they give classes and things, and I actually uh, did that once on a trip, and uh, but I sat in the driver's seat. I closed my eyes. <laughs> I, I'm not in the driver's seat, in the passenger seat. Mm. That would if I close my eyes in the driver's seat. <laughs> and you also gave an example, too, of a gentleman who was actually writing about exotic cars, so they were actually, he was being allowed to drive these cars sometimes up for two weeks, as long as oh, he yeah, did a write-up on them. And I thought, wow, that's something you, I could see that, you know, like a car and driver magazine, but it would be something you just wouldn't even think about. Well, that's the thing. He He loved cars, and so he started writing and blogging about cars, and literally, they give him a new car every week. I had another friend who loved watches, and he started blogging about watches. And now they send him a different watch. Every, all the watchmakers are sending him watches. A gal I know is a real you know, clothes horse. She loves clothes, so she started a blog about uh, clothes. And she gets all kinds of fabulous items from all kinds of designers. And they just send them to her because they want her to write about it. The same thing is true with a lot of YouTubers these days. Uh, they talk about and they review uh, items uh, on, on their YouTube channel, and they get all kinds of things given to them. So there's all different kinds of ways to, uh, to follow your passion and to turn it into something where you get to do what you love without having to spend a lot of money and you share your information and your excitement with others at the same time. You know, Marilyn, and I couldn't agree with you more because as I was sharing my experience about how I got into radio, <clears throat> the one thing I couldn't have expected, at first it was like being in a candy store, but I couldn't have expected the onslaught of books that came my way. And pretty soon, you know, at first it was fun. You know, I've got these books, and I'm getting press kits, and I'm even saving those because it just wasn't something I was used to. But after a while, it was like the cicada migration. It just kept coming, and it kept coming, and it kept coming. Now, there was one guy that I knew. He was a close personal uh, friend of mine, and uh, he was somebody who really loved reading science fiction and fantasy. So this is for you book lovers out there. But, again, what we're talking about, too, is being in earnest. Don't do this for the sake of, oh, geez, I found a way that I can get some really cool free stuff and hoard it. That's not what we're talking about here, as you were talking about. And I'm certainly going to impress upon people is you do this because you have a passion and you're willing to share that with the world. That's what's important here. So, And in this case here, he loves sci-fi and fantasy, and he was telling me about some of his favorite authors that he liked. And I said, so how often do you read? And he says, well, I don't read as often as I like because right now in my budget, I just can't afford to get out these books as they come in new. And I happen to be in the business now for a couple of years. And I said, what if there was a way that you could get all these books, that you also have the opportunity to talk with the people who write these books? And maybe in time, you might make a little bit of money doing it. And he says, really, you can do that? And I said, 
Okay, if you follow exactly what I tell you to do, and you do this in earnest, again, do this for the good of the whole and not just because you get free books, you'll be blown away by this. Okay, So I showed him the steps, and one of the book companies was Tor Books. These are the guys that, that publish the big guys if you're into sci-fi and fantasy. And uh, so certainly I showed him how to go about the process, and I brought him into PBS, and I said, here's I'm going to show you how to set up a show. Now, this guy went on, and I finally, we kind of lost touch with each other after a while, but you just seen this guy light up his enthusiasm, like this dream that he didn't even realize was coming true. And he began doing his own little show where he was doing book reviews on sci-fi and fantasy and interviewing these people, and in some cases actually meeting them face-to-face. And he started earning a little bit of money doing just that very thing. You know, he's not you know, making a living doing it, but it was something he just loved to do, and he was building an audience. And that's a lot of what we're talking about here today, aren't we? Yeah, it's really following your passion and also being open to the possibilities. And and if you, it's the same thing I, I feel like about charity events. You know, find a charity that you really believe in and volunteer there. And you might not have the $1,000 a ticket to go to the event, but if you volunteer, uh, you may get to go because you're working the show that night. And I love charity events too because not only are you uh, contributing to a worthy cause, but there's often all kinds of uh, opportunities once you get there. They often have silent auctions, and sometimes they have fabulous things at silent auctions. And if you are volunteering, you'll know even before uh, it gets posted what it is that you might want to bid on. I mean, I got a uh, membership to a gym that normally would have cost over $2,000 wow. to join, and I got it for $350 because I knew what it was worth, and it was on the silent auction thing starting at 250 I waited till the end of the day, and not many people had bid on it, so uh, I I bid three fifty and I got what I knew was like a two thousand dollar membership to this exclusive gym. So, um, and at the same time, it was uh, it was going to charity. Another time, I think I put this in the book too, is I was auctioned off as a bachelorette. Hey, there you go. <laughs> for, for for the American Lung Association, and that was such such fun. I have to tell you. I had a very wealthy girlfriend who used to go uh, all the time to Canyon Ranch Spa, a very exclusive spa that cost like $5,000 for four days. Well, I knew I could never afford it or didn't want to spend that kind of money on four days, but she was always talking about it. And then one day, out of the blue, uh, another girlfriend said, oh, I need some bachelorettes for this bachelor." bachelorette auction would you want to do it and I said yeah I'm game and uh, each of us had to plan our own date so a lot of the people got like dinner for two at a restaurant or rounds of golf at a country club with a picnic lunch afterwards and I thought hmm American Lung Association so I called Canyon Ranch Spa and I said Uh, I'm doing this charity event for the American Lung Association. Would you be able to donate uh, a stay for two? I'd need two rooms because I wasn't going to stay in the same room as the person who bid on me uh, for one of your, uh, for a weekend or four days at the spa. Well, guess what? They said yes. And so I got the spa. I got actually airline tickets. I got a limo to take us to the airline. And I got to be bid on by a handsome stranger (laughs) who also got the trip at a tremendous discount because it was, you know, what people were bidding. And so I got to go to Canyon Ranch Spa actually for free because I was I was doing something for charity and I remembered what I wanted and I was creative and said, hey, let me get it for now. And I was uh, auctioned off and uh, got to go to Canyon Ranch Spa with a handsome stranger who bid on me. <laughs> and not to mention, let's not forget this, you also have the Valentino evening gown that you would have worn on the red carpet and just for $50. <laughs> now, here's another right. one. Since we're talking about elegance here now, I like this one here that you talked about because this brought back memories for me. And uh, 
you know, obviously you're going to need to go in and get a manicure and pedicure and all these other things before you go on that night out on the town to go see Hamilton while you sit in the front row seat for $10. Um, but you're also going to need to get your hair done, too. Now, true story, back in the 1980s, I was becoming frustrated for just a basic haircut, and sometimes I'd want to do like a light perm, you know, because I have straight hair. But I got so frustrated at paying the kind of prices that these people were charging in hair salons just to maybe almost possibly get it right. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. And somehow, and I can't even remember how I bumped into this, but hair shows. Now, this is a place where people like Vidal Sassoon, Paul Mitchell, all these big hair people will come, and these are actual, you know, hair modeling shows. But you go in there, you volunteer your time, but you get made up by these top-of-the-line hairstylists that are showing off their products and also new styles and trends. And I thought, why don't I go ahead and try that? Well, how would you like your hair done? I said, this is what I'm looking for. And, man, they would hit it right on the mark. And all I had to do which I enjoyed doing is be in front of an audience and model for a little bit. <laughs> but you talk well, about that. Hair volunteers needed. Oh, oh, it's great. And the thing is, if people don't want to do it in front of an audience, don't worry. Because I do this all the time. I have very long hair and very thick hair. I, have, I tell people I have thick hair and thin legs, <clears throat> better than the reverse, you know. So, uh, but... It grows very fast, and I'm not good at doing myself because it is, it's a lot to manage. So I am a hair model, and people always say to me, oh, a model, I can't be a model. I'm not young. I'm not gorgeous. I'm not thin. And I say, uh-uh. the only thing you need to be a hair model is to have hair. And a lot of fancy salons, be it, you know, Vidal Sassoon or uh, all kinds of salons in your neighborhood, how do you think – they audition new stylists to come in. The stylist has to bring a model to work on. So oftentimes they'll advertise on Craigslist uh, under beauty. You go to the category beauty and you go to, uh, you plug in model and all kinds of different uh, possibilities will will pop up in in your neighborhood for places where they need a model, whether it's for a cut or for color. And uh, a lot of times it's completely free. Sometimes if it's color, they might charge you 20 or $25 for the product itself. But every single week, there will be notices for hair models. And it's not in front of an audience, so you don't have to worry if you're not outgoing like Daniel and Marilyn. (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Because it'll just be in the salon, and uh, I've had just, in fact, just this week, I got my hair cut as a model at a uh, at a salon, uh, Eden by Sassoon, and the gal did a fabulous job, and it was totally free. I gave her a tip, but uh, a cut like that would have cost me one hundred and fifty dollars at that salon regularly, and I got it for free because I went as a model. So you can either look at Craigslist or uh, there's a site called salonapprentice.com that has uh, opportunities in different cities. So I, I think Portland is on there as well. I'm not absolutely sure. So, um, and another way to get uh, good prices for getting your hair done is to go to groupon.com or livingsocial.com, and they always have hair salons that are uh, – offering discounts. But what I do with those sites is I wait till they have uh, discounts on their discounts because they'll send out emails, oh, today everything is 20% off or 30% off or maybe $10 or $30 off. So you can uh, go to regular salons that are just looking for clients and get a, a discount that way because uh, uh being a woman and even being a man, if you have great hair, it can be expensive going to get it done all the time. Absolutely. And like I said, too, it was a lot of fun doing it because they would usually do them three times a year. It was like, I think, in the spring, summer, and fall. So I would always look in the paper, and that's where you would actually find This was back in the 1980s. Now we've got the internet. Right. But right. what I loved about the experience, it wasn't just that I knew I was going to get you know that light perm that I liked. But I also enjoyed the modeling, just like you enjoyed performing as well. I, I enjoyed doing that. In fact, I have a good friend of mine 
who has been doing the bridal show here in Portland for the last 40 years. And his oh, was wow. the premier show. And one day we, we kind of ran into each other through a, a business relationship. And he says, you know, uh, this friend of mine is looking for models for my bridal show. And I said, really? And so I was involved as a model for the Portland bridal show. So I got to feel what it was like to wear a Scottish kilt. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Boy, was that sharp. And then, you know, <laughs> run this down the runway in front of 2,000 people. But what I was going to get at with the like the, the hair situation, the hair modeling was what I really enjoyed the most about it besides, you know, the hair design was the people, because these would usually be a course of two days. It would be a Saturday and then a Sunday. And so you'd build these relationships with people that were also doing it too, because you had a lot of time to kill in between shows. I mean, a lot of time. And so you you meet these just these neat people and you build relationships, and, and that's what makes all this so much fun. I, I totally agree, and I, I also love that. In fact, I'm looking to start doing a lot of speaking engagements about how to live like a millionaire when you're a million short because it's so gratifying, you know, being in a group of people and giving them wonderful information and and having them enjoy what you have to say and appreciate it and, and get to know new people. So that's what I'm also hoping to do is start doing speaking engagements across the country and and sharing my knowledge and information and having fun with a lot of people at once, like like I'm able to do by doing your show, Daniel, is spread the word and hopefully uh, give people lots of uh, lots of ideas and ways to uh, improve their life and have 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 more fun and enjoy life and again not not uh, have it break their break their wallets. <laughs> And not only that, but Marilyn's actually being modest, folks, because uh, what she's really saying is she's about to step off of mainland onto a ship and become a speaker <laughs> on a cruise ship. Now, we've covered the exotic hot rod. We've covered certainly the red carpet gala gown. We've certainly covered the, the wonderful hairstyle so that you can sit front row to see Hamilton for 10 bucks, And this is all affordable. In fact, what we're talking about here could run you maybe $150 for the night just for all this. But speaking engagements and cruise ships, everybody dreams of going on a cruise. And believe me, we've talked about cruise ships on our program. And, I mean, this is an industry that is huge, which means they also have a lot of huge empty spaces for people, maybe like yourself, who can find a way to get on a cruise and maybe not only be put up on the ship, but also even make money, maybe even a really good living. Let's talk about that. Well, cruise ships, yeah. I have a friend who was a comedian, and he was not getting work at all in Los Angeles, so he actually moved to Florida. But he now has become a big star on cruise ships because even though he couldn't get work here, he's a working comedian, and they fly him to a port, and then he does shows, and he can also go on the cruises. But you don't have to necessarily be a comedian or a singer. Uh, they have what's called destination speakers. Now, if you have a favorite topic, if you know about history, if you know about crafting, if you know about jewelry making, you can apply to be a destination, uh, a, a, uh, an enrichment speaker on a cruise and give a talk and get to get your, your cruise for free. And, uh, or a destination speaker, if you know about a certain place and you can tell people about it, that's another opportunity. And then for the regular working people, of course, they need uh, hostesses. They need, um, if you're a good ballroom dancer, particularly men, because a lot of women go on these cruises and there's dancing. So a lot of men who are good dancers go on and become uh, uh companion dancers for some of the women. So there's all different ways to do it. Also, um, reverse cruises are a lot cheaper than regular cruises if you go on the cruise that's taking you back. And I just recently heard sometimes some cruises, if you wait till the day before it's leaving, again, they want to fill it up and they haven't filled up their seats or their cabins, uh, you can get a great, great deal on a cruise sometimes if you wait till like the day or two before 
and make a deal with them because they want to fill those cabins. So there's all kinds of ways to do it. I haven't actually yet been on a cruise, but <laughs> one of these days I will. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like your speaking engagement's going to get you there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was thinking, too, since we're on a cruise and we're traveling somewhere, we did a segment some years ago that was a lot of fun where – uh, the uh, the guest was on the program talking about how you can stay in four-star hotels around the world and probably stay for as little as $4 a night. People are probably thinking, well, how's that possible? He says, but, but here's a caveat. It's going to take your willingness to be very, very adventurous. So I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, let's just pretend that you're in Iraq, for instance. Well, we know what's been going on there. Well, you know, you might be closer to the hot zone than you, than you want to be, you know, when it comes to the war. But, hey, a four-star hotel for four bucks a night, how do you go wrong there? <laughs> <laughs> I heard a funny story. This is sort of a joke, but it, it, but it, it's funny about a, like an, a 90-year-old woman who like lived on a cruise ship. You know, she was on a cruise ship every day back and forth and back and forth and said, somebody said to her, you know, how can you afford it? And she said, are you kidding? It's cheaper than the uh, than the uh, senior living homes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I still get all the things. I get dinner. I get things brought to my room. I get breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the show. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of funny. So I, yeah, We've I, certainly spoke a lot about the grand lifestyle, but one thing you're going to need to do that all of us will need to do is eat. So I thought that's one of the things we should talk about because I worked in the industry for a good few years way back in the day. And you were absolutely right in your book when it talks about, you know, these high-class restaurants. But one thing a lot of them have in common is what? Happy hour. There you go. See, and I used to think happy hour was just about going and getting inexpensive drinks, which is starting to curve. They're, They're getting away from that. But one thing that I didn't know was just how good and abundant the food is and the kind of money you spend for it. I love happy hours. I mean, and I, I'm not a drinker. I, I don't drink a lot of alcohol once in a while. I have a glass of wine, but that, but it's not really my thing. But I love food. <laughs> and I love going out to eat. So happy hour is like what I always suggest when I meet somebody uh, or if I'm meeting a new new guy or something. Because you can try all different kinds of restaurants, and I I just moved. Actually, I was living in a place for 23 years, and I had to move. So I'm in a new neighborhood now, and I'm finding these wonderful restaurants around me that, you know, I I wouldn't go to normally because dinners there, an entree would be 30 to $40. But they have happy hours where they have 10 different items for $6 or sometimes seven, eight dollars. You know, Ruth Chris has a happy hour for nine dollars where you can get tuna or a steak sandwich or lobster roll. And it's amazing that people don't even know about it. So I would say check those great restaurants in your area that you'd love to go to, but they might be too expensive and go to happy hour there because oftentimes they have really good food choices. Yeah, and I know uh, you actually mentioned a place that I'd worked a long time ago, which was McCormick and Schmick's. Oh, yeah. And, uh-huh. and uh, when I worked for them, and this is no kidding, they had a half-pound cheeseburger, you know, lettuce, tomato, and then sauce and fries for $1.99. It was a half-pound cheeseburger, and I challenged anyone, you find a better burger for that price anywhere in the city. But you had to be there from three to six. <laughs> right. But right. still, that's a heck of a deal, you know. Yeah. So. I mean, and there's some, you know, sometimes they have it like from, from four to six or five to seven or, and then some places have a late night happy hour. You know, maybe you go to the theater or you go out and you want to go someplace afterwards. And so check because some places have it like from nine to 11 or after 10 and, uh, you don't want anything heavy at that hour anyhow, but they often have really good food choices. So I'm I'm definitely a happy hour kind of gal. <laughs> Especially if you're going to go see Hamilton, because that usually starts around 730. You know, you just finally got your hair done. You got the dress. You're arriving in a Jaguar, and you're eating happy hour food with a good excuse. I'm on my way to go see a performance. I got to get in and out of here. <laughs> That's about when, you give that extra money to your server, and they're going to love you to death anyway as well. So 
I love it. I love it. I'm coming to Portland so we can all go out together. (laughs) Sounds like a good time. Now, ultimately, here was one I wanted to really leave our listeners with because we talk about traveling to exotic places, things like that, and living what seems to be or pretty much is the millionaire jet set lifestyle, if only for a brief moment from time to time. I think the more you experience that, though, I think the more you're going to move into that direction. Maybe not right away, but in time, you want to feel what it's like to, to feel like that and that it's possible. And certainly these are ways a lot of us can do this. But one of the things that I'd like you to talk about, elaborate on, is we were talking about the idea of volunteering. And, uh, and, and you give some really unique suggestions for people who may have dreams. Uh, just last night I was watching on Netflix uh, this uh, series, or it's actually uh, – they had just, uh, I think it's one season, on Galapagos Islands. So let's say you're somebody who wanted to get into ocean- oceanography, things like that, or you're someone who wants to maybe build a farm. We actually have a friend up in Washington who's part of that cooperative you talk about in the book where you stay on the farm and you provide work, but at the same time these are people who are actually learning about this thing as well. Let's talk about some of the opportunities that people can consider as they're listening to this when it comes to that expansive world of following your dreams? Well, it's amazing to me that more people don't know about this. Like if you want to go away to a a place, but you don't have a lot of money, there are a lot of different uh, opportunities, both in in the States and abroad, where you can go volunteer and uh, you get a terrific uh, vacation while you're volunteering or learning about things or or helping other people. You know, Habitat for Humanity is one, I think, that has uh, different uh, places you can go to and help build homes for people who need it. They did that in New Orleans after uh, after Katrina, and they have it uh, across the world. You mentioned the, the, Oce- the Oceana thing. There's places where you can go, and, um, and I don't know them offhand, but... Uh, but they are in the book. You're right. Uh, and uh, and then another place where you can volunteer, which uh, actually is a fabulous place, is um, in Spain. I told my girlfriend about it, and she didn't believe it, but she actually went to a Sp- Spain and spent six nights at a four-star resort for free. And what this is, it's a place called Vaughn Town, and they, uh, all they want you to do is ha- be a native English speaker because they have... Uh, Spanish uh, executives who want to learn conversational English. And so they uh, pay for the resorts, but all the English-speaking people go, and they get to spend a week uh, having lunches, dinners, breakfast, entertainment, and all they have to do is speak English, and uh, they get to spend a, a fabulous time. My girlfriend said it was the best vacation she's ever had. And some of the people there had been there 15 times. Wow. And, yeah. So uh, so many people don't know about these things. It's, it's amazing. But um, uh, I list a lot of different places. There's, if you're a family and you want to maybe show your, your kids or your grandkids a farm, there's lots of opportunities, again, both in the States and abroad, to take your family on a vacation where uh, you'll be at a farm and you'll have to maybe do four to six hours of work over a few days and at the same time experience what it's like and show your kids or grandkids uh, what it's like with with animals or growing crops or things like that. So uh, there's all kinds of things to open opportunities and learning uh, while you're having a wonderful vacation at the same time. Absolutely. And, you know, as I was talking about this friend uh, that we have that's up in southwest Washington, uh, one of her passions, and she has what they call the that agricultural sustainable farm where people actually go and they volunteer their time. But you get ah. to stay there. She cooks for you, things like that. But you actually work on the farm. And it's not real hard work either because you're also learning things. But one of her specialties is the bee. And to give you an idea what has happened, she actually wrote a book. I think it's called Queen of the Sun, but I could be wrong. She put that on Amazon, and all of a sudden, publishing companies got into a bidding war over this book. Oh, wow. And believe me, it's a phenomenal book about understanding the bee and how vital this thing is. But here's someone who can firsthand. It was funny because 
I knew about bees. We all know about bees, and most of us think about bees, and we think about how to avoid getting stung. (laughs) But when you go and you learn from her and you see these creatures and you see them the way she understands them and she shares this, you look at the world in a completely different way. And that's certainly what your book helps people to come to grips with. You don't need to win the lottery and sit there and wait and dream that you'll have enough money. We're showing you guys out here. Think about changing and breaking the rules or at least understanding how to play them better, and you're going to find opportunities you could just never imagine. What would you most like to leave with our listeners here today, Marilyn? I think it's just, you know, open your minds and to new possibilities and enjoy life, and uh, you can do anything you want to do, really, if, if, if you if you do these things. And um, also I want them to visit howtolivelikeamillionaire.com. Obviously. <laughs> because yeah. that's, that's where they can uh, find information about the book and go there. But I just, it's been a real journey for me, and I wish everyone who's listening to have a wonderful journey and do things you love and, and, and uh, not have to spend a lot if you don't have it. And, but still be open to having a, a grand time and, and don't think that you can't. Hmm. And I couldn't agree with you more on that. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. It's been a lot of fun, and it's kind of fun that we've pieced together these kinds of segments over the years, and your book really encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about over the years. All in one area, people can kind of explore. They can certainly experiment, and most importantly, really find themselves with the possibilities right there in your fingertips, and the answers are a lot easier than you think. And most importantly, I tell people, look, when the next big lottery comes up, here's what you do. You go out and you buy yourself a $2 ticket. I think it's getting up to half a billion dollars now, believe it or not. (laughs) Now think about this. Now now if they'll just do this exercise, and and I believe you might even agree with me on this, sit down with that ticket in front of you, then get yourself a legal notepad or a spiral notebook, whatever, and write down everything you believe you would do with this money, as if you've already won it. I mean, the ticket's there, so the possibility now exists. Would you agree? I love that okay. idea. I and, love and it is. that idea. You get all those dreams on paper. This is what Tony Robbins, and we know who he is, a self-help uh, guy that helps coach people to achieve their dreams. He says, this is what you call capturing. So you capture all these down. Right now you've got that lottery ticket that's showing you it's possible you could win this money, okay? It's a possibility right now. Write down everything you've ever dreamed of doing because a half a billion dollars is certainly going to achieve pretty much all of that in ways. But now if you don't win, you've got how to live like a millionaire sitting in front of you, (laughs) and you can actually (laughs) achieve all these things in ways that you could have never imagined. (laughs) Marilyn, I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> I, you bet I'm doing it, but I do that every single time, and it's amazing, you know, and, you, and, and it's amazing what you start thinking about. You get past the things you want, and that's actually a very small list. You know, mm-hmm. it gets bigger when you start thinking of what you can do for others, you know, and that's what the amazing thing is. That's what I like about your book, How to Live Like a Millionaire. You talk about that consistently, about how you just commit your time, and you'd be amazed how rewarded you are for that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's been wonderful talking with you, and I am I love the thing with the lottery ticket. Yeah, it's There fantastic. you go. You can post that on your <laughs> Facebook page, How to Live Like a Millionaire When You're a Million Short. <laughs> Marilyn, one more time, go ahead and give out that website. It's howtolivelikeamillionaire.com. Doesn't get any easier than that. Marilyn, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Oh, thank you so much. It's been great. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter so you can stay up to date on what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past that way.